I love that it says on my screen, actual recording is higher quality. I wish that (laughs) it could be true of what came out of my mouth. Actual recording is It's like, hey, good job trying to (laughs) get your camera up and stuff, but we'll we'll go ahead and take care of it. Yeah. (laughs) It's, it's, It's very patronizing. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Preaching Lab. We're so glad that you've joined us. We have a super special guest with us today, um, someone that I am very fond of. Both of us are very fond of. We like this person quite much. Um, It is our good friend Steve Carter. If you do not know who Steve is, Steve is a pastor, an author, uh, a speaker, and he is currently one of the lead pastors at an incredible church up in the north side, of Illinois, North Chicagoland is Elgin Chicagoland. Northwest, yeah. right? Northwest suburbs, yeah. yeah. Northwest uh, Elgin suburbs. is, and then Rockford is like moving towards Wisconsin and Iowa. Yeah, Rockford doesn't know if it's in Chicagoland or not. It doesn't know what it wants to be. <laughs> Steve, we are so glad to have you here with us. How's your day going so far? It's great, man. It's good to be with you all. Obviously, Rory, we go way back. So much love and respect for you. And yeah, same, man. Andrew's been such a, a voice... Um, just a just a, a voice of truth and uh, just someone I deeply deeply respect. So it's great to be with you guys. Mm, we love you, Steve. Yeah, we do. Us. We do. One of the things that we do on here, Steve, as we get started, just sort of get conversation flowing and to sort of give people a picture of who is Steve Carter as a preacher and as a pastor is something we call the first five. So first five questions right out of the gate. You can take as long with these as you want, or you can rapid fire answer them. We will do it however you set the tone. First question for you though. Um, thinking about your preaching, what is the best piece of coaching advice you ever received about preaching? Best preaching advice. Wow, that's really, really good. Um, I, I, I Honestly, I think it's – there's probably a thousand different ways I could answer this. The one that's kind of just near and dear right now has been um, don't transfer information – Anybody mm. can do that, mm. but speak from a transformed place. Mm. Speak from a place of how the text has um, wrecked you and put you back together. How, like that's that's what we are called to do. Mm. That's good. Speaking of the text, uh, we tend to preach out of the Bible. That's a pretty typical thing for us. Super recommend to <laughs> do it. <laughs> we, we, we recommend it. It's a great book. Um, Steve, if um, if you were given the choice for the rest of your life, you can only preach out of the Old Testament or the New Testament. Which one are you grabbing? Uh, I'll go New Testament. Oh, that's good. That's the right answer. Jesus is in the New Testament. My answer would be completely different, not because I don't like Jesus, but whatever. Um, Steve, you're a big fan of Top Gun, so I got to ask you this question. Top Gun, the original, or Top Gun Maverick, which one is better? Oh, uh, The original. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> slow start here on the preaching lab. <laughs> one, one for three. One for three. Oh, no, one for three. One for three. What? I mean, explain explain how the second one is better. Uh, I think this this is a hot take. I think Top Gun the original is just not a good movie. Wow! <laughs> wow! Wow! I think just, we gotta have a podcast episode about this. <laughs> yes, just, real quick, real quick. This is this. You can you could rattle off actors who are like legitimate stars. Mm. I mean, that mm. started in Top Gun. I mean, it's like and the lines. Mm. You know, where would he go? Where would who go? I mean, you're right slider, you stink. You're, Easy cougar. I could go all day. With, your ego's with these writing lines. checks that your body can't cash. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's so good. <sighs> well, we, maybe we'll start a movie podcast. Who maybe knows? we will. Coming <laughs> soon. First episode yeah. is is Top Gun, the Movie Watchers <laughs> Lab podcast, or not? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, question number four for you, Steve. Who has been the greatest? encourager to you as a preacher? Hmm. You know, this is, this is, this is kind of interesting. Today um, marks the seven year anniversary of my mentor, Hal's death. Um, Mm -hmm. He was my youth pastor. Um, He was really like the first one who saw something in me and um, all the way up until, you know, basically a year before kind of I got succession at Willow, um, we talked weekly and he'd listen and he, um, he just, uh, 
was a special, special person. And um, he died in a motorcycle accident um, wow. riding with his father. And uh, he's a pastor in, um, at that time in Phoenix. And uh, But, man, he just... Um, He's, he, he, yeah, it's hard to find the words, but he, he just had a way to see something in me that I couldn't see mm. and, um, like call it out. Mm. And in a way that, um, because Hal said it, it made me believe it could be true mm. and, um, mm. was a uh, pretty monumental in my formation, but also in my vocational calling. Do you think about Hal on the daily? Um, yeah, I, I do. I mean, oh, there. there are these moments I, I still hear his voice, you know, he, he would always say to me, you know, um, I don't care how many points you score. I don't care. I don't care where you go to college. The only thing that matters to me is your integrity. Mm-hmm. Um, integrity is the only thing that will take you seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, seasons, years, decades to earn and seconds to lose. And, um, wow. at the end of the day, I only care that you are who you say you are Living in Christ. Right. Wow. Wow. And so he just, he was, that's what he'd always like basically end my, the calls with always just reminded me integrity, integrity, character, character. So, yeah. Jeez. Which is a great segue into this last question, Steve, if you could be remembered for one thing as a preacher, you know, let's say years from now, Steve Carter is long gone, but Steve is still talked about. What's the thing you hope people say about you? Besides your hair. Cause I know we can't <laughs> see it in the, thing here but you do have really great hair i just had to um you know i i hope that people believe i'm worthy of trust i think character and integrity yes but i i hope Mm. that um people think i'm i'm trustworthy and for me trust is like a mathematical formula uh, safe plus consistent again and again over and over on repeat Mm makes you a person that's worthy of trust. And if, if I, as a, as a pastor, can be safe and consistent with the text again mm-hmm. and again, over and over, um, I hope I will be worthy of my congregation's trust that mm-hmm. I am. Like in, when it talks about a Barnabas, you know, he was, yeah. a, he was a good man, yeah. full of faith and the Holy yeah. Spirit and led a, a, a number of people to the Lord. And um, yeah. that's, that's kind of the, the, the hope um, for me. Wow. Well, Steve, you certainly have proven to be worthy of trust, and mm-hmm. we thank you for that. I appreciate you a lot. Um, I'm wondering, Steve, for the sake of uh, of people who maybe are, are don't know you as well as we do, um, thinking about your preaching, you as a preacher, like what is the? It would be hard to say, "Hey, Steve, give us your life story and how you became a preacher." But what is like the context for preaching that Steve Carter comes from? Where did you first start? How did this all like unfold for you? When did you know you wanted to do this for the rest of your life? So this is going to be wild. Um, I, and honestly, I, I don't talk too much about it because oftentimes people can check out right away. Sure. But, uh, you know, I, I grew up in California. I was in Hal's youth ministry. Hal gave me like a shot to be a volunteer. My parents actually come to faith later in life. So mm. I got to baptize my mom in my senior year of high school. got to baptize my father on my wow. 19th birthday. Wow. My dad comes out of the water and he's like, hey, um, I feel like I heard this prompting to sell everything and move to Michigan. And we lived in Southern California. And I was like, I don't know if that was the Lord. We live in California. <laughs> um, but, it, but it really, you could just feel that it was real. My dad said, I felt like the Spirit told me I needed to restore a relationship with my folks. So we moved there. It was after my sophomore year of college. I was a walk-on at Cal State Fullerton on their basketball team. Didn't play, but I got free shoes. And um, I, uh, I moved to Grand Rapids. I don't know anybody. And my best friend grew up in Pasadena, went to Lake Avenue Church. And mm-hmm. when he was a sophomore, there was a, a guy by the name of Rob Bell who was his like intern. And so he said, hey, there's a quirky guy named Rob. Like, I think you'll like him. So I showed up, I think, week four of when Mars Hill began. Wow. And I just kind of got jumped into that wow. early days. So this is 99. And f- people had told me, like, how going to ministry, I think you have this, da, da, da. I just, it, it was like that weird spot of, Okay, maybe, but I um I went and met with Rob one day, and I was like, "How do you know? How do you know mm. you're supposed to go to ministry?" And he's like, "Well, what do other people say?" And I'm like, "All right." I started thinking about how, but I was also volunteering at another local church, a small like restoration movement church, mm-hmm. and um I didn't really have a good answer for for Rob, so I drove home, 
and we had remember like answering machines mm -hmm. and there I saw a voice mail and I hit it and it's the pastor of this small church and he was asking if he could have a meeting with me. So I was like, I called him up. I'm like, I can be over there in 10 minutes. I go over there and the guy just answers Rob's question mm. and offers me a job. I didn't take the job, but it felt as if God was saying, you have this question. You know what Hal said. You know what people have said. Now you know this pastor saying it. Mm. Please do this. So I ended up going back to California and I, I'm, I kind of majored in preaching with a biblical studies degree. And, um, and then Rob invited me to be his intern. And there I was at Mars Hill from 2002 to 2009. So I was there pre-Love Wins. That's what always people want to ask and know. Um, but it was a, an amazing, amazing ride where I learned so much about communication. From there, I went to Rock Harbor in Costa Mesa, mm. worked with Mike Erie. Mike was a, just a dear, dear mentor, a friend of mine. But while I was in Michigan, um, met Bill Hybels through um, his daughter and son-in-law, and then spent uh, seven years in Willow. And so it's kind of been Mars, Rock Harbor, Willow has been kind of my trajectory. All the now. easy churches to be part of. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. There's, there's, there's a theme here, and it's uh, don't bring this kid, uh, Steve Carter, to your church. So. It Steve, all started when. It all started yeah. when we brought on Steve. That's right. Well, Andrew, you make that joke, but I think like you know, you trace some of that, and and you can see, Steve, like it's it's poured out of your life. You've said it already. Like character for you is such yeah. this like a high value in a preacher. So I'm I'm curious though. I want to ask this. Um, does a pastor with high character inherently make them a good preacher? Mm. No. <laughs> so what what are some of the like what are the other pieces that you're like character has got to be there? It's like an intangible. It's it's uh, it, it's got to be there. What are the other pieces that you look for, whether it's in yourself or other people that you're like, oh, this is like the sign, like you've got the you've got the juice to preach. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is something with character and charisma and calling. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that there's some really, really incredible women and men. I absolutely just deeply, deeply respect, and they they are incredible shepherds and leaders. Mm -hmm. But preaching isn't isn't what they do well. Right. And, but man, you get them in a discipleship one-on-one -on -one or mm. a counseling situation, or when someone's walking through a season of grief, man, mm. I'll, I'll take that all day. So, mm. um, I think for me, it just starts with, does this person have that spiritual gift mm. of teaching? And there is this sense of understanding, man, you, you've got that charisma. And I don't mean charisma in the sense of like, oh, you can move a room. I just mean like, <clears throat> there is... Y y Somehow this this book comes alive mm. when you open it, and it's it's more than the way that you read it. It's yeah. more than the way the 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 thoughts that you think about. But somehow you're able to both go on an inner journey yourself towards transformation, while you're also understanding the ache and the desires mm. and the strongholds of your community. And as you unpack the text, you can bring that yeah. through, and you can't you can't seem to shake it. Like you you just you are addicted to the process of prepping and becoming mm -hmm. as you get the privilege to preach. And and I, I just think some people, they like the concept of it. They like the mm. idea of it. They don't like the prep of it. And mm. um, that's that's when you know you're called. Yeah. I was, you, you, tell, me yeah. What you, tell me what you think about this, Steve, because I'm thinking about that question. I was reflecting on it as you were answering it. I was reflecting on my own life. And I I'm born and raised in church, and I uh, i think I was probably five, six, seven, maybe, when I first started thinking, I think I want to be a preacher. And there was, I truly, like, I because I just was in services. I grew up Pentecostal, you know, like, it's just you're in church all the time. But I would watch what our pastor did when he was preaching, and something in me was like, yes, that's it. Mm. But when it really started, like, I thought I, th there might be something here, was like, I noticed when the Lord really started revealing himself to me in high school through the scriptures, I would be reading the scriptures, and I would almost always, um, at the same time that I was feasting on them in my own heart, I was also thinking, how would I say this to somebody else? And then I would find, I would be like, I just had this instinct to like look for occasions to bring what I was learning up in conversation, and I would watch people lean in, mm. and I would watch light come into their eyes. And that for me was like this little, it almost felt like this little carrot that the Lord was putting in front of me. Like, see, mm. that's how I've called you. That's how I've equipped you. Would you say that you had kind of a similar experience as you were sort of grappling with your calling? Because that for me just became confirmed over time. And then, 
you know, the first few times I got up in front of people, nervous as a cat as I may have been, there was still that instinct to be like, but the word of the Lord is burning in me and yeah. I have to say it to you. And then watching them lean in. Any similarity with your own experience of no, your calling? I, th- I think that's I think that's fantastic. That is exactly it. I mean, it's almost like a stand-up comedian where they're constantly working on bits and they're like, right. oh, that's funny. And they're just trying to build out, you know, a, a special. I think I I would start to read something and I felt like the Lord was like speaking to me or sh- yep. or like wrecking me or putting me back together and I was like, and I could frame it in a way whether a question or a thought or have see it in a prop or through culture, and s- to your point, like I I experienced all these younger students like mm. leaning in, mm. and that's actually what that pastor said to me. He said, uh, um, "Steve, I've never seen someone really." gain the attention yeah. Yeah. and you have a superpower that you could actually take them somewhere for good yep. or you could really use that for yourself. Mm-hmm. And I just see you being someone that could take them to greater depths with Jesus. And I was like, oh, and and, and some of it was like, it just felt natural. I didn't even, I wasn't like working at it. It just, yeah. it was something I wanted to do. I was yeah. reading it for me, mm. but I was thinking about it for the yeah. students or for the people in my life. Yeah. I love that. I mean, and that's where the character piece comes in because that can be so intoxicating. Yeah. Yeah. The crowd that. and all the adulation of that. But at some point you start realizing pretty quick that if you don't have character, your giftedness is going to take you to places that your character can't sustain. Yeah. And the bottom will fall out of your life, which we've seen all too often. But yeah. Yeah. I love that. That resonates with me. Yeah, so I think following the thread of this here a little bit, like, you know, there are these moments in our lives where we we have these feelings of like, oh man, I, I want to preach, I feel called to it, other people are identifying, whatever. But then there's that moment, the first time you get asked to preach and you sit down to the blank white screen, like both of you have written books, so you know the feeling of like the cursor just like <laughs> staring at you. Menacing. Um, And so the, the part of preaching that I think gets so many people caught up is like, is what does it look like to even prepare this thing that I'm going to go stand on a stage and talk for 30 minutes? And Steve, you have such... Um, I remember the first time I've heard bits and pieces about like what prepping for a sermon looks like for you. Um, I'm curious, what does that process look like now? And I'm and I'm also curious, how has it changed and shifted over the years from being the junior high you know, guy in, in Michigan to now pastoring a church in Elgin, Illinois? What does that look like for you? Yeah, you you know, in some ways it's it's similar. In a lot of ways, you know, it's it's different. Um, I think it's been more of a honing of a process. Mm. The more hours you get into it, the more that you kind of oh yeah, this is this is what I have to think. I think early on, I just jumped to okay, what what does Scott McKnight think? What does you know Gary Burge think? What are like the anti right? You know, you just mm-hmm. you end up jumping to 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 hear these voices of people that you respect. But I, I, it hit me probably when I was a middle school preacher was like, oh, but N.T. Wright doesn't know what it's like to be a junior high student in Granville, Michigan. That's right. <laughs> like, I, God, you've put me here. Like, I've got to, I got to figure out a way to first start with that. And I, and I started kind of honing in on um, six words, and then actually, like, part of my experience at Mars, um, I, I started to kind of prep through uh, something of four directions. And so um, so the, the, the six words, I, I start with these three, ache, desire, and stronghold. And mm. I, if I read a text, let's, you know, let's say, you know, Acts 16, um, I'm thinking about my people. What's mm. like, what's the ache that they're bringing in? Mm. Um, it, you know, some people would call it a felt need, but what's, the, what's like that ache that's happening in our, in our congregation right now? Mm. But I also know that like our people have good desires. And I think the church at times is shame desire. So people don't necessarily know what to do with the desire that God has put on their hearts. And and I think in that way, um, I think people who show up to Four City, um, they want to be good mo- mothers and fathers. They want to walk deeper with Jesus. I think leaders ask why questions. Congregants often ask how questions. How do I do this? Mm. And that good desire is me just trying to to be really intentional to to kind of see that. And then the stronghold is as I as I think about our culture and the city and the in the area that we're in, what are the what are the the ways at which the enemy has a stronghold that man this this passage should be addressing and attacking and preparing my people to kind of kind of step into and be um, 
a change agent. So those are those three words. The next three words are, and Andrew, you might you might have a similar piece for this in writing, but um, when I think about writing a chapter, it's all based on problem, premise, promise. So what's mm. the problem I'm trying to solve? Yeah. What's the premise to attack that pro- that problem? Mm. And then what's the promise benefit if the reader or the congregant actually puts that into play? Mm. So if I'm flipping through the text, I'm just and I I'm like, oh my goodness, Th- this I think could be the problem. And and oftentimes when I'm reading like let's say Acts 16, there could be 12 different problems in that same text. Right. And and I'm just trying to figure out and name it. But those six, all I'm trying to figure out and sense from the Lord is, where's the soul of this talk? Yeah. Where is it mm. you want me to say? Yeah. Um, the four directions, though, is just a, another way. And I try to teach this to younger communicators, but um, as, as, you're, as you're walking through it, a text, I always think of forwards, upwards, inwards, and outwards. The forward is, how will this text help me live life together? Because Christianity isn't a solo sport. So how, how will this help me embody walking with Christ in community well? Mm. Going upwards is um, the pursuit of God's presence. How will this text help me pursue God's presence? Mm. Inward is just the process of sanctification, becoming whole. Um, w- where is this text calling me inward? And then also outwards, spiritual gifts, evangelism, service, hospitality. Where is this text calling me to actually, um, and prepare me and equip me so that I can embody this well. So those kind Mm. of 10, again, are just helping me identify where do I sense the soul of a, of a teaches. Mm. So let's say Acts 16, You, you could talk about Paul and Silas in prison. You could talk about the two of them being chained up and they're singing um, and you can talk about how the other people are listening. So their backs are up against a wall. They're still praying and worshiping. Mm. You could talk about that. You could talk about the earthquake and how the soldier wanted to take out a sword and die by suicide. And then you could, you could talk about one of the greatest lines ever in the scriptures. And yeah. Paul says, don't harm yourself. We're all here. It's mm. powerful words for our culture mm. when, with mental health. And you could talk about the question that Paul asks that jailer and that man believes and is baptized. You could talk about how the jailer shows hospitality, right. he covers wounds and prayer. So I could go through all of that, and it's just me trying to get in tune to what is the actual problem? Yeah. What is it that I'm trying to say? So, so that's where I start. Okay, I got to ask you this question then. Talk to some of the, maybe those that are younger or newer mm. to the craft of putting together a sermon. Because I love what you're saying. I think that the longer you're in this, the more you develop an instinct like that for like, I'm reading the text through certain lenses and I'm mm-hmm. already asking certain questions. But there's a pitfall, I think, for those that are newer to the process in that, if they, at least from my perspective, that if they do that, they might not read the text as deeply as they need to because they're thinking, they're not thinking, what is this text Mm. trying to do? Mm. But they're thinking, what am I trying to do with the text? You know what I mean? So how do you prevent that kind of in your own prep where you actually do let the text unmake you before you start thinking about how am I going to communicate this to others Mm. through those six words in four directions? Yeah, it's so good. So the, the, (laughs) the one that I don't ever really talk about, but it's just, I think you named it intuitive, um, is backwards. And that's for me trying to find the context. Right. What is the actual contextual background? I, I I just will like kind of nerd out, geek out and that stuff. But as I'm not trying to nerd out on that to teach it, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to get like, help me understand what that prison was like. Like a help feel for what, what's actually happening here. Exactly, exactly. So the other kind of, um, for younger communicators, oftentimes it can, if you go through the process that I did, it can be very biopic of a pastor's life. And we've we've seen sermon series where you're mm-hmm. like, oh, this is just a bi- biography of right. what this guy has gone through. <laughs> right. That's not what I what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is, and I in you know different seasons of ministry, I just have different pictures of people from my church that mm. are up on my screen, and in that I'm like, I'm trying to to see. Uh, their face, mm-hmm. and I'm just trying to go okay with what the text is trying to say. First Timothy four, the way it ends is like, if, if you watch uh, your life mm-hmm. and you watch your theology, 
you, or your doctrine, yeah. you will save though your listeners and both, also yourself. Yeah, both yourself and your hearers. Exactly. Yeah. And so you gotta hold that tension mm, yeah. of I need to know this and 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 it first has to start with me. Mm. So the other thing I'd say is I'm not working on messages for this week or next week. Mm. I'm working on January and February right now. That's awesome. Mm. So I can live in yeah. this and I can marinate in it, and it. I have time just to go. Is this actually the soul of it, mm. or is that just something I like want to say? And there's time is, for the text to wreck you, because I've heard a lot of preachers talk like that. Like the text has got to wreck you. Okay, well, great, but that's hard to do if you didn't start prepping days. until Tuesday. Yes, you know. Yes, the text of scripture, the story of scripture, you have to live with it for a long period of time. And the best preaching moments come out of the deepest revelations, but you can't microwave that cannot. You got to be in it for a long stretch of time. So I love you forecasting enough where you're like three months from now, we're going to be here. So I'm going to start letting this text get under the skin of my life now. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, Steve, I imagine there are people who are listening to this who are going, oh my goodness, I could never be thinking about January in October. I could never get my brain to do that. And I imagine you didn't always do that, right? Like, I think, I imagine that has to at some point become like a, it's a learned thing that you're doing. Was there something that caused you to go though, I need to start projecting my teaching out. I need to start being a few weeks at least, if not months ahead. Was there something that caused that for you? It it actually began when I was a junior high pastor and I started to get um, opportunities to speak at camps. Mm. And really like cut my teeth teaching at camps mm-hmm. during the summer and and Mars really gave me that opportunity to to go out and teach but oftentimes when we go speak at other places we are speaking the best sermons mm-hmm. that we had done in the previous year or the previous season mm-hmm. i i started to think what if i use the camps as my try on material for what i was going to teach for the coming oh, fall the- Mm-hmm. It, and so so what happened was the summer became, and I used these camps as both study breaks, but also here's my first like four months from <laughs> September to December. Uh, I'm, and I would throw in maybe if I'm teaching five or seven times, maybe like one or two talks that I knew were going to be a good home run. So like, but I, but the rest of them, it was forcing me not yeah. to try on my material to my congregation first. I was trying on. At a, at a camp, and then that that was tight, and it was strong, and then I could bring it right in. So that process allowed me to constantly be pretty much four to eight months out. Hmm. And once you start that process, it, it's it's difficult to start, but once you get into that rhythm, man, you you can exhale, mm-hmm. you can breathe, you can to your po- point, Andrew, you can speak from a place of deep revelation. You mm. you 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 see it, the props all around you. Yeah. You can't take your mind off of it. Yeah. You you know, it just it 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 has a weightiness to it. And for me, that oh man, that became so addicting. Mm-hmm. So Steve, you got these six questions, these four, well, five directions, right, including backwards. Once you start drumming up answers to these questions, what are you doing with that material? Yeah, great question. So so then if I, I get the sense of, okay, here's the problem I'm trying to attack. So let's say I want to, I, I feel like, man, this is, this is a sense of a message on mental health. Mm. Um, and I'm going to, I, I really feel strongly, and this is when I think about the ache of our congregation and our, the desire to live just wholeheartedly and with a sense of deep, deep union with God and Christ. Man, I got, I got to, I got to do this. So I, I kind of frame that into a sentence or a phrase, mm. and and then I just, I start studying. I just, you know, um, it typically starts with my inner linear, um, and I'm just looking at the the words, mm. um, and I'm just, I'm just diving into to the commentaries um, to you know, um, different voices, um, whether on that topic or subject from there, all I'm trying to do is create a sermon brief. Mm. And I have sermon briefs that are probably about eight to 12 pages and they're, they're scattered. They are all over the place. It's but just it basically is just the sermon it. brief is basically just stuff that you've pulled together pulled that together. all in one way or an, all in one way or another is kind of circling around this central theme, this central thing that oh, 100%. you've identified like the problem. Yes. Then from there, 
I just start flipping through it and I take note cards and I just basically start writing on note cards. Hey, um, of that, which one of the eight to 12 pages, what, what do I like about this? You know, like, oh, I, I love, I love this. Like, don't harm yourself. We're all here, man. That what an anthem for the church. Okay, boom. Uh, oh, that story that I thought about. Oh, yeah, that word in 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 yeah. Greek. Oh, that. Mo- so I usually get to about twenty eight to thirty, um, just note cards, mm-hmm. and I I lay them on a the floor, and I go, okay, now I got to arrange them from yep. A um, to Z. And then I'm like, and it's like storyboarding. And yep. then I look at them and I'm like, no, nah, I can eliminate. This is one of the hardest things in the prep process. Kill Most your darlings. Creatures- <laughs> Kill your darlings. Yes. yes the yes. art of elimination. Yeah. And you just right. have to. So I get that down. Yeah. And then for me, most most preachers put their sermon in an outline, outline form. Okay. But the secret sauce of a great sermon outside of obviously Holy Spirit study, all of that stuff, the secret sauce is pacing and energy management. Yeah, it is. So I put those note cards on, like on a magnetic board in my office, and I have a 10, which would be like Zach De La Roca, like, killing in the name of, you know, like, you know, just like fired up, right? And a zero would be Bueller, Bueller, you know, just dry. And from zero to 10, where am I coming in with my intro? Mm. And I pace it out, and my 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 literal talk, I map out like a stock market graph. Oh wow! And I take a picture of that, I draw that out, and then no joke, guys, I carry those note cards with me, and I carry a note card that has the stock market graph mm-hmm. in my back pocket, typically, and I'm just going through them, going through them, going through them, and then I manuscript all of my talks on my phone. And I, this, this is, my wife's, my wife's literally like, you're going to have arthritis. And I'm like, uh, just in, just in this thumb. That's just, all. That's just in my thumbs. But I, I, I walk and I manuscript and then I use Otter. Yeah. And but I you're talk. like, what you're doing is you're, archi- you're architecting your language. You're exactly. Cra- you're crafting. I, talk, so you're crafting I tell the story. Yep. Yes. Yes. I tell the story. I listen to it. I'm like, that's too long. Cut it. And I just keep working on it. Wow. And I'm constantly just working on that yep. and going, is that the adjusting the stock market graph. Um, and and yes, the spirit changes it sometimes in, in services and you got to be open. Yes, totally. But I really believe the more prepared you are, the more freedom you give to the Holy Spirit. Wow. And so, yeah, that's kind of how I go about Steve, it. Steve, that feels like a really involved process to me, but I'm guessing that it's not 25 hours. Yeah, how Can long Can you talk to it? us about like how much time and over the course of a week you're actually investing in that process? So I... <sighs> So if I have all the whole mapping, yeah. the idea of the problem, I've done a ton of research. Like, like so we're going to kick off in January. Um, from January to um, Easter, basically on prayer. So our mm-hmm. Lent season is going to be in prayer, mm-hmm. but we're January's all in the Shema. So I've been I've been working on you know heart, mind, soul. Um, body. So just kind of working uh, on that. Okay. So, so in have, a given week, it would actually be difficult for you to say how much did you spend on that sermon because you've done so much pre-work on it. Mm. Exactly. So I'm probably like, I'm probably always 10 hours working on the what's out, but I would say in the course of a week, it's probably starting 10 days before I teach that message, the Wednesday before um, or two Wednesdays before is when I start just picking it back up. Mm. Um and looking at it and just like oh yeah this is this is it and I'm trying to like hone in on the notes yeah. going through the sermon brief and <clears> beginning <throat> to to just and sometimes I'm like what was I thinking this mm-hmm. this is terrible <laughs> like I don't I don't have it and you know and but most of the time I'm looking at it and I'm like oh yeah and then I'm taking it probably ten hours in those ten days twelve hours mm-hmm. um moving it into the, the, the stock market graph, beginning mm, yep. to manuscript it in that way. What's cool is that you've set up some things that allow you to be thinking about it even while you're doing a whole bunch of other things. Right. Do you have any other kind of things like that? Because I think about, I mean, most pastors are, they the, preaching is not their only thing that they do. Right. They're leading the staff and they have admin to do and there's and pastoral care and all of it. So you have to find ways to be working on it kind of even when you're not working on it or to be able to work on it in the cracks in your schedule. So do you yeah. have any other things like that that are like helpful things where it's mm-hmm. like, hey, even if you're not button the seat working on sermon, 
you still can be doing something that's productive? Yeah, for sure. I mean, part of it, and you you both understand this, it's you have to you have to begin to master what you do with good ideas. Mm-hmm. What you do with mm. filtering good ideas. So sometimes you you hear something or you read something, and you're like, that's a sermon series. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's just a sermon. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, that's just a tweet. <laughs> Oh, that is actually a, a a blog post or an article. Right. Oh, that's actually a podcast. That's actually a book. Mm-hmm. That's actually a chapter. Mm-hmm. And and beginning to get good at that. And so on my phone, if I if I hear something and I'm like, man, like this guy was telling a story in our baptism service, and he said this great line. He said he was he was um, he's been sober for 32 years, mm. but he said it was the Holy Spirit that helped him curb his compulsion. And I was like, curb your compulsion. Mm. And you just like the sound yeah. of it, like just, and I just wrote that down. I'm like, yeah. I don't know what that is. <laughs> like that just could be a, a an Instagram post on that guy's baptism. But I was like, man. Yeah. You know, and, and but just filtering it and having space. And just saving things, it, if oh, it stands ahead. out at all in the yes. world. Yes. It's potential sermon fodder. Just make sure that you remember it somehow. Mm, I remember we talked yes. about this when I was on your podcast. You kind of asked me about my process. And I was like, I just, if it has any kind of hmm, like a resonance, a resonance, just pay attention to it. And you don't know what it's going to be for, but you might be reading. I was, I think the example I gave was reading Calvin. And he had this great line where he said, there's not an ounce of vigor in us, save for what the Holy Spirit instills. And I was like, all right. I mean, that right there, that's got so much resonance. Yes. That that's gonna like create a moment and a message in the future. And I don't know what message that is, but I suspect it'll be around Pentecost. You know, it's like that kind of <laughs> thing. So I wrote it down in a sticky note and just slapped it on my whiteboard and just kind of waited for the moment and the moment comes. But you gotta find a way to do that. Like yes. catalog basically the yeah. things that are sticking out to you. And I think the one piece is uh, some people catalog well, they just don't constantly look through it. Mm-hmm. And right. so part of like just constantly go through, I'm like, oh yeah, like I have stuff that, you know, I could I probably have like a year's worth of tweets that I've never tweeted, you know, out, but I just, I just, I've filtered it, mm-hmm. but sometimes I have to go through that and go, oh, that's actually a really, really, that could be a, that could be a now be a sermon because of what's happening in our world. And so part of that is just cataloging it, but continuing to yeah. be familiar with it and yeah. making the space, which is what I usually use Monday mornings for mm. is just in that process to go through and is there anything new? Is there anything I need to add? Is there anything that I've captured that I got to maybe just put in in this category or this area. So you guys are both no notes guys on a platform, but Steve, you manuscript, you said you manuscript all of it on your phone. You don't manuscript anything. Your notes Mm -hmm. are crazy to me. You don't manuscript anything. No, I do like, (laughs) I do like a mind map that takes me through what I'm going to do, but I don't, I don't, I don't manuscript. I do kind of, and once I've kind of got that mind map together, I will walk it in my head. Yeah, so yeah, I kind of yeah. know how I'm going to be saying things, and I do the same thing that you do, but I just don't write it on my phone. I'm kind of crafting language, but I, yeah. I don't manuscript, no. no You're well, such a great writer, mm, um, and, and the way that you um, communicate, yeah. sometimes I'm like, oh, is he a writer who teaches or a teacher who writes? Because yeah. your, your, your command over language is so strong. It's so precise. That I, that I, I would literally thought that you manuscript and write chapters because yeah. it's so... <laughs> academic and rich in theology and yet so practical and personal and pastoral. It's like, there's a, there's a beautiful cocktail in what you do, but that's wild to me that oh, you don't. Thanks. Yeah. It's a totally different approach. I'm super duper precise <laughs> in the writing, but then in the speaking, I have kind of another agenda basically, yeah. you know, and it's yeah. not exact precision. It's more about connection, but that's a whole well, different podcast. Well, I bring that up to simply say, Steve, I think when I talk to people all the time, I'll hear them say something like, I wish I could preach without notes, but I'm a manuscript person. And what I just heard you say was a, a bit paradoxical for me in that you do manuscript, but when you hop up there, it's mostly no notes. Are you just memorizing everything? Are you like... It just are are you so internalized with it that you can just get up there and roll? How does the like transfer from manuscript? I'm getting ready to walk up. How's that working for you? So <clears throat> there's probably three principles that I carry. One is I manuscript it because I just want to practice getting it into my body. Mm-hmm. Like I want, I want to be ins- ensured that like, yes, I have command over this. I mm. feel it. I know it. The second part of that is 
I want to I want to hone in on verbal precision. Mm-hmm. What are you trying to say? What are you trying to help people feel and know and, and apply to their life? The other part is, um, you know, the use of slides, PowerPoint, or in my notes on my Bible. If I have almost like a little bit of a key, if I circle a word, if I underline it once, if I bracket it, my brain knows. Oh yeah, remember circle that yep. is give the background of the word mm. underline oh there is a like that's double underline there's fire there talk about that there's a there's you know mm. brackets context so i have these little clues that i literally in my bible that I, it's a cheat sheet that it can still feel because a value to me is I want to have a conversation yep, with the congregation, mm. yep. and that allows me to do it. If so. you're going to do that, then you have to set up cues, basically, that take you through the conversation, because even though they're saying amen to you, they're not exactly talking back to you. So you have to, <laughs> basically, sure. you have to set up the conversation, and that's what you did there. Yes, yes. Yep. Steve, you have a message. It's Sunday morning. Steve is standing on the front row, or wherever you stand when you worship. Does the has the prep work for you completely ceased at this moment, or are you still like interrogating what you're about to say? Um, I try not to. The prep process isn't done until the sermon is is delivered. <laughs> right, right. Because you're you're constantly. My job is to be faithful in my preparation to create more freedom for the spirit to move. Right. Mm-hmm. But I I have to discipline myself to worship and be present. And I try not to be thinking about my message. Mm -hmm. I try to start to feel what's happening in the room. And as I walk up on the stage, I'm usually either the song before or as I'm walking up, I'm just trying to look at the room and I'm literally just saying, I love you to each section. I have four sections in my room. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. May you feel God loves you. God loves you. God loves Mm. you. God loves you. It just, it's almost like, again, a pitch pipe for me. Um, And then it's just go time. I he's, love that. He's a machine. It's a machine. You yeah. both are machines. I'm in awe constantly <laughs> of this. Um, Steve, I want to respect your time, but one of the things that we could start, this could be a whole nother podcast where we talk about everything that happens mm-hmm. now once you actually end up on a platform. But Steve, um, I know your heart for pastors and preachers. I want to give you space. What would be the like, what would be the word of encouragement, challenge, teaching, whatever that you would give to the pastor right now? who is struggling to find the good news while he is preaching on a Sunday. But week in, week out, he's doing it. What would be your words to him? You know, I have three questions that I ask myself um, when I get done with the text. It doesn't matter what anybody said to me in a line. Mm. It doesn't matter what emails that come in that are critical or um, praising, you know, that was such a good message or... Um, you've gotten so much better, which is my favorite. Um, uh, you've really grown. You've really grown. It's but it's but it is so great because it's so true of First Timothy four, where yeah. where Paul tells him like, so that everyone may see your progress. Devote yeah. yourself to this, you know. <laughs> but um, I ask myself, did I say everything God asked me to say? Mm. Second, was there anything in my life, unforgiveness, anything in my life? that held me back from saying what God asked me to say. Mm. And this one's, this one's like a weird one, but it, for me, is just, um, did I have fun doing it? Absolutely. Mm. Because for me, I want to always check. And we grew, we all, we grew up in the Jordan era where Jordan channeled anger to to beat and yeah. devastate and yeah. decimate. Mm-hmm. And and Steve Kerr said mm-hmm. that the two most competitive people he's ever been around was Michael Jordan and Steph Curry. Steph Curry. But he said what what's different is what motivates them. Mm-hmm. And that Jordan's motivated by anger and Curry's motivated by joy. Mm-hmm. That he gets to do this. Yeah. He gets to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We get to do this. Yeah. We get to spend time mm-hmm. with the Lord. We get. We actually get paid. Not well. We yeah. get paid <laughs> yeah, to right. study God's <laughs> yeah. word and to get up there and share with people. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to do that out of anger and yeah. bitterness and frustration. I want to mm-hmm. do that from joy. And so mm-hmm. I, for me, I just asked myself, did you have fun doing this? And I was like, yeah, I did. 
if I can answer those questions well, mm. I don't care what anybody says. Steve, mm. somebody recently said how when you're, he said, you look like you're having fun when you're preaching. I said, I am. <laughs> he said, how do you keep that from becoming like pride or ego? Mm. I said, well, do you remember Proverbs 8, where wisdom, the craftsman at the side of the father says, then I was filled with delight day after day, mm. rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in the whole world and delighting in mankind. Wisdom had fun making the world mm. with the Father. And I said, that's how I feel. Mm. I feel mm. like every time I get up to preach, I'm making a world yeah. with the Father. Why shouldn't I have fun? And yes. that joy is actually humble because it's not about me. It's shared. Yeah. We're sharing this together. It's not yes. about it's not about me. It's about us. Yes. And yes. that's I mean, you carry that. You carry that mm. so well. It's the joy of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you know what's awesome about Andrew is I just, I feel something, I say it, and he's like, Proverbs 8. And he just <laughs> recites it. And I'm like, that's, that's yeah, what you said. I'm going to steal that's, that. that like, it's it. just Try so working beautiful. with him, man. Try working I with him. It's just, I, I love, this is the one thing I love being around the New Life mm-hmm. guys and mm-hmm. the team there. You know, just anytime I've in- interacted, women, men on staff there. Man, just your ability to constantly go come back to the text mm-hmm. and come back to rich theology mm-hmm. and formation mm-hmm. in ways that are wildly accessible. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's like one of my favorites. It always inspires me and makes me better. Well, you inspire us, man. Yeah, you do. Man, Steve, thank you so, so much for hopping on here with us. Again, we could have talked for another hour and a half about everything that happens once you get on a platform. Maybe yeah. we'll have to do that someday in the future. One of these days. We shall see. Steve Carter, thank you so much for joining us. Andrew Arndt, this has been another episode of Preaching Lab. We'll see you next time. <laughs>